Take your Bibles this morning and turn back with me to the, the book of Nehemiah. Now, it's taken some of you all week to find the book of Nehemiah, <laughs> but it is in the Old Testament. It's uh, right after Ezra. But I just want to read one verse from, that we ended with last week and, uh, and then uh, start the message this morning. I'm preaching this morning on the prayer of Nehemiah. And I think it's a very interesting prayer because I know Brother Jim's done a great job uh, teaching some of the prayers of Jesus. And I think there's never... In the Bible, I'm not sure there's a prayer more appropriate for the time in which we're living than this prayer of Nehemiah. And so let me read uh, verse 4. And it said, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, That's pretty good, and that's a lot of times where we stop. But from verses 5 through through, um, the end of the chapter, verse 11, we have the prayer of Nehemiah. And I want to go back as as we start out, and I I want us to read again Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. The prophet said this, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I think it's very important to say, as we finished last week, that many of the walls that were built not only around the city of Jerusalem, but also around the country of America, have been broken down. I think there's no doubt about that. We, in many senses, have lost our moral compass. Things that used to be wrong are now right. And things that we would have thought were out of the question for our nation are now being practiced on a daily basis. I'm concerned about two things especially. One was the fact that the governor of uh, California said that all churches are going to be shut down during this time and declared that churches in California are not essential services. It was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, not the California Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court. And Justice Roberts, who is kind of the key pin between the conservatives and the liberals, went over to the liberal side and said, we agree with the governor Churches in California are not essential services. I think one of the things that we have here in Texas is a, not a false sense of security, but we, we're not living in the midst of New York City or Los Angeles. We have a different, we have a different insight of Freedom, we have a different insight as to our security or uh, our danger to ourselves. And, and let me remind you again today, we need to practice social distancing. We have older people in our church. We have people that are susceptible to the virus. And we, we young people <laughs> that are young and... Uh, and vibrant 
and uh, have never had any health problems, uh, need to be careful for those who find themselves cautious. And let me just be careful, be careful, be careful, not of yourself, but of others. The next thing is we have such unrest in our country. And if there's ever been a time for somebody to say, you know, we need someone to rebuild the walls. We need someone to go and do as Nehemiah did and get this thing back, not economically where we were, not just financially where we are, but, but morally and spiritually where we used to be. You know, we came off the Second World War as a very grateful nation. The men and women who fought in World War II were considered the greatest nation, the greatest people. Why? Because they sacrificially went to war to preserve our freedom. The men who went to Korea and fought in the Pacific did it for our freedom. The men and women who down through the years went through Vietnam, they fought for our freedom. The men that have gone to the Gulf Coast and the Gulf nations to fight and to die, Iran, Iraq, have done it for our freedom, Afghanistan. And what God needs to do, and by the way, you have to understand that Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was simply nothing more than someone who brought King Arxaxerxes his food. But he would have to taste it first to be sure that the king wasn't being poisoned. He had to drink the wine to be sure that it wasn't tainted or bad for the king. Because if some, anybody was going to die, it was going to be Nehemiah and not the king. And he would bring that and lay that before the king. And God laid upon the heart of Nehemiah to go back and secure Jerusalem once again. Well, he was a slave. He was a captive. How in the world was God going to use this simple servant, cupbearer to the king, Archaxerxes, to go back and do this tremendous task. I hope last week, if you watched it, uh, our computer blew up last week, so we didn't have visual, but I hope you looked at all the wall that went around Jerusalem and the some uh, 12, 13 gates that are in Jerusalem. All the walls were down, they were broken down, and all the gates had been burned. And it was Nehemiah's task to go back. He, that's what God laid on his heart. Well, there's more to it than just a church saying, whether it's a big church or a little church, however we want to say it. Oh, God, send revival to America. And I think if you'll be real diligent reading Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31, you're going to find that Nehemiah's prayer follows that admonition from Isaiah. And so I want us to look, and I, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but there are actually seven points <laughs> to his prayer. Now, what did he pray? He said, I prayed before the God of heaven. Now, if you and I really want revival, you know, revival has started in the strangest places. Wouldn't it be an interesting thing if God just chose to start it in Rowlett, Texas? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be great? And some of you are going, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it'd be a wonderful thing. And I want to tell you, there's nothing that will restore America and the people of America, all colors, all kinds, all nations in this country back to where God wants us to be except for a spiritual revival 
That's the key. That's the key. And by the way, I don't care what you hear on the radio or what you hear on television, there is not presently a spark of revival in America. There's not. So how do we pray? How do we pray? How do we pray that God will maybe use us, use me, not, not us, but me, you, to bring about, and maybe we're not going to be the, the spark that brings it, but if I believe if we pray right, God will raise up the right cupbearer. And will let us have one more revival before he comes and takes us home. And by the way, that's what Jesus told the apostles. When are you coming? When are you coming? When are you coming? He said, you just do what you're supposed to do, and I'll come when God the Father tells me to come. I, 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 little, I get a little weary sometimes where everybody's... I, and by the way, I'm looking for the Lord to come. I'm looking for the Lord to come today. Amen. But I'm not looking for him to come and rescue us. I'm looking for him to come and take us. And we need to be in the rescuing business as long as God leaves us here on the face of the earth. And so let's look at it. Number five, the prayer of recognition. And here's Nehemiah's prayer. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Wow, what a great verse. That is the prayer of recognizing who God is. Now I want to tell you something. God can still create. God can still do any miracle that he decides to do. And God still can bring revival to a nation that has turned their back on him. God is God. God never changes. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Grasp that. And here's what Nehemiah said. Jehovah is the only God of heaven. Thou shalt have no other gods before me because every other so-called God with a little g is a fake, a phony, normally a, a demonic spirit and has no life, no arms, no hands, no feet, no eyes, no nose, no mouth, no ears, and cannot do anything for you except expose you to the demonic world. He is the only God. He is the only God. He is the God of heaven. Number two, Jehovah is a great and terrible God. A great and terrible. There is nobody greater than God. Nobody greater than God. And he is, the word terrible sort of in our vernacular means awesome. Awesome. He is awesome in his salvation. He is awesome in his, in his redemption. He is awesome in his power. He is awesome to help change us from the sinners that we were to the saints that we are now. He is awesome when unsinners stand before him and have to give an account for their sin before they're judged and thrust into the abyss. I want to tell you something. All of the skeptics, all of the atheists, all of the, uh, the, the schemers, all of the wicked people in the world believed in God when they saw him, his awfulness, when they closed their eyes in death and opened their eyes in hell. Jehovah keeps his covenant. Boy, I like that, don't you? That, that means that God keeps his promises. There is not one promise in the word of God that's directed toward us that he will not keep. So why do we fear? Why are we afraid? Because we really don't believe he will keep his promises. But Nehemiah, this cupbearer, this slave, this captive said, God, I know that you're not going to put something in my heart that you're not going to fulfill. 
God does not call without equipping and making that call possible. I believe with all my heart that God called me to this church. Brother Charlie, you remember the days when you had to hold up the bills and say, is there anybody else here can pay the, the light bill? And I was telling the kids in my Sunday school class this morning, I was telling them that God has been so good to this church. We have a CPA that watches over our finances. I want to keep Brother Charlie in check, but uh, <laughs> watch over our finances. But I want to tell you, they called me and said, uh, Pastor, we know you're a church, we, but you're also a business. And you're, you, are, you qualify for a loan, a loan that you can borrow so you can pay the employees of the church and the bills of the church over this coronavirus type thing. And if you do that, you won't have to pay it back. And I said, I, I want to thank you for that. But I also want to tell you, we have enough to pay the staff. We have enough to pay the bills. We have enough to go through this period of time. And I said, I personally believe that the church ought to be run by the tithes and the offerings of God's people. And I said, thank God, Brother Charlie, thank God we are where we are now. That's a miracle. How did that happen? It happened because I put myself in the place where God called me, God equipped me to be your pastor, and God has used me as your pastor. Now that's what God does. Could God use this church? Absolutely. Could God use you? Yes. And then he keeps his mercy for them. I'm going to tell you, Nehemiah needed mercy. He needed mercy. And he, and he said, he provides mercy in our lives, number one, for those who love him and for those who observe his commandments. Now, very quickly, number two. Number two is the prayer of confession. The prayer of confession. Not only the prayer, we need to know who we're talking to when we pray. I'm afraid a lot of Christians just talk to the ceiling. Or they talk to themselves and are so impressed by all the big words they can use. You know, they talk about the God of Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all the Boam boys. You know how that goes. And um, thank you, Bob. I appreciate the little <laughs> chuckle back there. And, uh, but God wants us to know who we're talking to. And he's a great and terrible and only God. But the prayer of confession. Look at verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, before the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Now I want to t t talk to you a little bit about confession in prayer. First of all, there's got to be the confession of transparency. The confession of transparency. If God does not know we are serious, we're shooting words into the wind. God has got to know when it comes time to confess our sins before the Lord, we are transparent before the Lord. That's what he says, let thine ear be attended, let thine eyes uh, open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. He's saying, watch me, look at me, examine me. I want to be transparent enough that no, you know exactly I am as sincere as I can be. That's how we pray. That's how we pray. The next thing he says is the prayer of passion. He said, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Do you understand that God is not concerned by our little, now I lay me down to sleep? 
I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now that's okay for children, but it is not a prayer for revival. It is not a prayer of rebuilding the walls. It's not a prayer for doing business with God and seeing God do miracles. It's not. What's he talking about? He said, man, I, I, I'm praying before you now. And he said, I pray before you night and day. We ought to wake up with this prayer. We ought to pray this prayer during the day and go to bed with this prayer at night. If we're serious. And I'm going to tell you, Nehemiah was serious. Then there's the prayer of declaration. The prayer of de declaration. Now, what kind of sins does he pray for? Now, I want to tell you, I doubt if there's, if there's, if there's 10 percent, I'd be surprised if 10 percent of the people in our church pray this way. And by the way, I haven't always prayed this way either. But there are three things that he prayed for in confession. And, and let me just say this. I, I know none of you husbands and wives ever have any disagreances in your house. I know that. But my wife and I have only had one argument in our marriage. Now, I have met one couple that told me they've never had an argument in their entire marriage. And I just saw on their forehead go, liar, liar, <laughs> liar. <laughs> but we've only had one. It started the day we got married, and it's still going on. <laughs> but if you know Ruthie at all, she's a pretty feisty little gal. She says what she means, means what she says. But you know, the worst thing I ever want to hear, and I, and I look at her and I know there's something wrong, and I say, dear, what's wrong? She says, nothing. <laughs> well, I know what that means. There's something big going on. <laughs> and what I've got to do is I've got to search it out and, 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 I, and, and, you know, I, I've already told her, and it's already written down, Morgan, you've got it, what I want on my gravestone, yes, I know it was me. <laughs> I've had that through my marriage. I've had it through my family. I've had it through my churches. I just, I just accept it anymore. But here's, here's the deal with God. God's not interested in your generalities. Oh, Lord, I go to bed tonight, and just in case I did anything wrong, forgive me. Doesn't work. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. And so what did Nehemiah do? First of all, he, he says this. He said, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of thy children of Israel... He, the first thing he began with, he confessed in detail the sins of the nation. Do we every morning confess that our sin is a nature, is a, is a nation of baby killers? Do we confess that we have racists in our country? On both sides? Do we confess that we have lawbreakers in our country? Do we confess that people have been wrongly accused and sit in prisons for years until they find out that they didn't do that? I mean, I want to tell you, this nation has a lot of sins. And it'll probably take you half the day just to confess the sins of this nation. But this nation is not... It, it never has been perfect or totally righteous. It has sins. The second thing he does, he goes to personal sins, personal responsibility. 
which we have sinned against. We have sinned. Not just the nation, but we. We. And we confess our sins. Lord, I said something today that I should have never said. I heard your call today, but I didn't follow it. I, I, I thought something today that I should have never thought. I went somewhere today I should have never gone. I mistreated somebody today that I should have never mistreated. I'm talking about specific sins that breaks my relationship, my fellowship with God. And I'm going to tell you, until I get to that point and name it, there will never be harmony with me and God anymore. By the way, I have to do that with my wife. If I, if I make a mistake in church, I've got to publicly admit it. I've got to name my own sins. And then I love this next thing, and I want to be careful. I doubt very seriously if anybody here has done this until I've done it this week studying this message. Both I and my family's house have sinned. That's the sins of family generations. We all have, we all have stories of generations past. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. And part of confession is confessing the sins that we know about our parents and asking God to forgive us. Uh, don't, don't forsake the fact that the sins of the fathers are passed on to the third and the fourth generation. That's the word of God, guys. And if I'm going to be free of those sins, I need to ask God to forgive them. Grandparents. I love my grandparents. They were great grandparents, but I know things about my grandparents that I had to for ask God for forgiveness for this week. You say, what were they? None of your business. <laughs> Great grandparents. And I'm going to tell you, that's what gets God's attention. Amen. Cindy, you have Native American heritage. What was done against the, the Indians in this country goes back to the sins of our nation. You see, I don't under, think we understand the power of prayer. I don't think we understand how powerful it is. Because if we ask, confess our sins to the God of heaven, he's great and terrible and will forgive those sins. You say, man, I can, I can ask God to forgive my grandparents' sins? Yes. It doesn't take them out of purgatory. It doesn't make the difference where they are in eternity right now. But it takes that, that burden, that, that sin load that's on me, it takes it off so that I will never do it. Then number seven. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't you wish. Number three. <laughs> and that's the prayer of details. The prayer of details. In verse 7 it says, And we have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. And he understands that sins must be detailed. Our, our sins against you, Lord, and our sins against the law. I'm going, to, I'm going to hurry real quickly. Number four, the prayer of accountability. In verse eight it says, remember, I think it's cute, Nehemiah asking God to remember. I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, 
If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. He said, do you remember saying that, Lord? He said, I'm remembering you said it. He said, Lord, remember your word. Because I'm remembering it right now. Remember your warning. If ye transgress, if you follow other, after other gods, if you turn your back on me, if you no longer keep my word, if you no longer keep my commandments, if you do that, that's a warning. You know, I, I'm not sure children today even understand. You know, parents used to say, if you do that one more time. You know, when my dad did that, I knew whatever was coming next was going to be coming if I did that. And I'm going to tell you, when God says it, why do we think he didn't mean it? When God says, if you do this, why don't we think that God means that? He does mean it. He means it toward a nation. He means it toward a church. He means it toward a pastor. He means it toward the congregation. He means it to us individually. He means it to us as a family. If ye transgress. And then he said, remember your punishment. You told us what was going to happen. You told us that if we transgressed against you, that you would scatter us abroad among the nations. And he said, that's why the Babylonians came. That's why the Medo-Persians came. That's why I'm sitting in captivity right now as a prisoner serving the king. I understand that. We need to understand where we are as a nation, that we cannot violate the laws of Almighty God without an if. Someone has, someone has said, and I think wrongly said, by the way, if God, can forgive, if God forgives America, he'll have to apologize to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I don't believe that. God's not going to apologize to anybody. But if God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, God will just as likely judge America. I don't know if you feel any pressure from that, but I do. I don't, I don't want my children to go through what I think is coming. I don't want my grandchildren to go through what I think is coming. I don't want my great-grandchildren to go through what I think is coming. Well, then I maybe better pay attention to the if. If we go down this road, don't cry about what happens to them. It was us. It was us that put the judgment on them. But then I want us to number five, look at the prayer of promise. Look at verse nine. And if ye turn unto me, he's continuing, remember... But if ye return unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though we were of you cast out into the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. God says, okay, if you disobey me, I'm going to scatter you all over. But I want to tell you, if you turn around and repent and confess your sins, I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. I like that. Don't you? It's not too late for America. It's not too late for our families. It's not too late for me. It's not too late for this church. Do we grab that? Look, if if my life's going down the toilet, and I certainly hope it's not, but if it is, it's not too late. I can come back to the Lord. 
If our church is taking the wrong path, it's not too late to come back to God. If our nation's going the wrong way, it is not yet too late because he hasn't scattered us yet. We need to remember the conditions, the side note, no no matter how far you're away, I'll bring you back. The promise, I'll bring you back. Number number six, the prayer of relationship, verse 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. You know what that is? That's a prayer of relationship. Don't you like what he says? We are your servants. You know what I'd like us to say together, and not out loud, but just say as a church, we are your servants. Now, what does that mean? It means that you are our Lord, and whatever you say, we will obey. Number two, number two, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great Power. Do you know how much power it took of God to redeem my wicked soul? To redeem your wicked soul? It took the death of his son, Jesus, the perfect, sinless son of God, to leave heaven, to come here, to be mocked and ridiculed, and put on an old rugged cross and to shed his blood and die so that we might have our sins covered and forgiven. His great, God's great power, the greatest power God had beyond the creation, beyond the animals, beyond the the filling of this world, the greatest power God has ever exercised was saving you and me. And Nehemiah reminded God that we are your chosen and we are your family. I know I belong to the Smith clan, but let me tell you something. I belong to the heavenly band. I may walk on earth, but my home is in heaven. We are the redeemed. We've been bought and paid for. Then the last thing, number seven. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper and pray, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. I want us to notice just a couple things here. Number one, please pay attention to my prayer. Please, uh, please pay attention to our prayer. That's what I'm asking. If I lead in my prayer life, I don't want it to just be my prayer. I want it to be our prayer. Then please pray attention to those of us who fear you. Do we fear God more than we fear man? Do we fear God more than we fear what others think of us? Do we fear God more than anything else in the world with a reverential fear? And then he said, please pay attention to my need for success. You say, preacher, I didn't think we were one of those uh, uh, prosperity churches. No. But it, it was a, he, I, think, I think it was Nehemiah that said, prosper me. Prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Do you know, when we're doing God's work, 
Do you understand we can pray for God's prosperity on our actions and, on our, on, and success on what we're trying to do? You know, I pray for the success of this church every day. I pray for the success. I remind God, hey, God, this isn't my church. This is your church. And I'm just trying to do what you want me to do. And, and I need you to prosper it. I need you to bring people here. I need you to, to open up the doors here and, and help us to minister better to our community. Nancy was telling me this morning. And not, I'm sorry, not Nancy, Sandy. Sandy was telling me this morning, she said, Preacher, I really, really liked your sermon on forgiveness. And she said, I've sent it out to this one and 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 this one. Because they had conflict in their families, they had conflict in their own soul, they had conflict with being angry at God. And one lady came back and said, I've listened to that sermon five times because that was the need of her heart. Who would have dreamed that that was even possible six months ago? You see, right now our church is not confined to these four walls. Our church is making its way out there. Uh, it, and it's, you say, oh, it's because you're such a great preacher. You baloney. Don't, you don't believe that for a second. It's because God has put his hand upon this ministry. And I've asked God to put his hand on me, his servant. Give me the messages to preach and I will preach them. Give me the points and I will emphasize them. Help me to help the people and may it go as far as you want it to go. And then he says, please pay attention to my need for success. He said, prosper, pr prosper me today. Prosper me with mercy. Prosper me before the king." Ooh. Artaxerxes was the king of Persia. That's Iran. He was powerful. And here's this little servant coming, and he's asking God to prosper him before the king because God's put in his heart to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. He had nothing. He didn't even have his freedom at this time. He had no materials to build with. He didn't have the approval of the king. He had no workers. He had nothing. And yet he prayed for success. Boy, don't you like that? He prayed for success. He said, <laughs> and I like this. He said, prosper me, for I have, had, I, for I have no chance for success without you. I have no, no chance for success without you. I'm going to give this illustration that I'm done. Of course, I also like to close. But when I went to Longview, Texas, I was 23 years old. I went to a little 30 by 50 building on Jenny Street. Nobody had ever heard about Jenny Street in Longview, Texas. And right next door, we had a horse, pass, uh, a horse pen next to the church. Our buildings were on pier and beam, and inside it had faded red curtains, had two space heaters, and no air conditioning. The light bulbs were not beautiful. There were no chandeliers, but there were closet light bulbs screwed into the ceiling just so we could have light. So 
Six months after I'd been there, we had a church split. I lost half my deacons, half the Sunday school teachers. Everybody was givers. Lady got mad at me, had given the organ. She came, picked up her organ, took it away. Somebody else had given something else, took it away, and so we had to make a rule. If you don't pick up your stuff by a certain, certain date, it's ours. Well, they all came and picked it up. And God had blessed our little church. We started out with about 60 people, and within, within, within six months, we had 150 people on a big day. It was pretty exciting. And I looked around and said, whoa, what's happening? I was still 23. I was a kid. I had a, I had a sermon, hell is hot, hell is real. If you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. I mean, that was, that was about it. But I prayed this prayer. I did. I, I, it, in 1969, I prayed this prayer. Lord, I need your success. I need your hand on me because I can't do it. And if it gets done, if it gets done, it's going to have to be you because I can't do it for myself. And by the way, neither can you. You can't live your life. You can't run your family. You can't be the right kind of brother, sister, son, daughter, mother, father, grandparent. You cannot be who you need to be all by yourself. You've got to have God to be successful. And by the way, that's the right kind of success. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. I'm so glad you're here today. It is so good to see all of you. And Sarah just saw you again, and it's so nice to have you visiting with us from Pensacola. And I'm wondering how many of this morning say, God spoke to my heart today. He's putting some things in my life that I need his help to be successful. Not monetarily, but who I am and what I do. I need God's help. I need God's prosperity. I need God's success. Whether that's being a good grandparent, whether it's being a good parent, whether it's being a good child, whether it's being a good brother or sister, whether it's being a good worker, it doesn't matter what it is, but will you be a prosperous servant of God and do what he wants you to do? If that's your prayer this morning, like it is my prayer, would you simply just slip up your hand and hold it there for just a minute for God to see it? For God to see it. Not me to see it, but for God to see it. God, help me. Make me successful. God bless you. Thank you. Maybe you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus is your personal Savior. You're not 100% sure if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven. But you have a longing in your soul to know this wonderful Savior. The reason that I'm the pastor of this church is to be able to allow you the opportunity to come to Christ. If you're here today and need a Savior, I'm going to ask you to step out. I'll meet you right down here in the front. Maybe it's God's will for you to become part of this ministry. If that's the case, I'm going to invite you to come and become part of our church. Maybe you need to just come to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't have time today to do all this, but I need to confess my sins, the sins of the nation, the sins of my, my, the generations before me, 
so I can have your blessing and not be living with the things that were passed down to me from my parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents. I don't know what God wants to do in your life today, but I'm going to ask, if God wants to do something, please let him do it. You can sit where you are. You can pray where you are. You can come forward and have someone pray with you. I don't care. But let's not go out of here without doing business with God. Our Father, bless this invitation. And may we respond according to our desire for you to prosper.